this video, I'm going to be covering RPM Dynamics MS48 and TB72R. I'm also going to be installing an Apple Mac Mini into the MS48. I'll be showing you how to update all of the cards, download and install Tracks Live from Waves, which is the software I'm going to be using for the multi-track recording and virtual sound check. And last, I'll be showing you all the connections required to integrate this into the Pro Series consoles. Now we're going to install the Apple Mac Mini into the MS48. To do that, there's two thumb screws right on the back of the unit that we can just go ahead and loosen off and remove the lid and put it to the side. Be careful not to lift the lid all the way up. Just come up here for a couple fingers high and then just remove the lid and then just put this to the side. As we see here, we have all of our connections for the Apple Mac Mini that are going to perfectly line up once we make all the connections. Here we have the two AES-16 recording cards from Lynx. Now let's go ahead and put the Mac Mini in. When I put it in, I usually like to keep it up at an angle to allow access for my hands to insert the cables in. Let's go ahead. Normally I like to work from the outside in, but right now I see that this EtherCon connector is a little bit longer than the others, so I'm going to go ahead and get that into place first. Next, I'm going to plug in the power cable, ensuring that there's a tight fit connection. Next is the HDMI cable. Then our two Thunderbolt connections. With the additional Thunderbolt cable I have over here to the side, I could use that in the future if I ever want to use any Thunderbolt recording hard drives. Now that I have the two Thunderbolt ports in, I'm going to go ahead and install the USB ports. One thing you notice, we have three internal USB cables, but we still have one additional USB port left on the unit. And just like that, all of our connections are in and we can go ahead and put the cover back on the unit. To put the cover back on, you'll notice that there's two little notches on the inside of the unit. Let's go ahead and line that up to the ears as we slide it in and place the cover gently back down on top of the unit and secure the two thumb screws. Now we got the Mac Mini installed, let me just go over the front, which is going to be really quick. Here on the MS-48, we do have a USB port on the front. I currently have a piece of gaff tape on there to keep the dirt out. On the front, we also have four vents to keep everything inside running cool. When I've been doing my multi-track recordings, I find that there's very little heat coming out of this, so these vents are working very well. Here, we have a white light to indicate that the Mac is on. So once we engage our power button here, we're going to see that the Mac is actually running. Now, for the TB72R, this is the easiest one. There's no controls and nothing for us to do. Once we power up the MS-48, that's going to send the power down the Thunderbolt to connect to the TB72R, and we'll have a blue status light showing that we have connection. Just like the MS-48, we have a vented grill in the front to ensure that the cards are going to remain cool. So now we're looking at the back of the MS-48 and the TB72R. So we're going to go over all the connections on the back of the units. One thing I want to point out, on a lot of my equipment, you might notice that I have gaff tape in various places. This is something I personally like to do, to go ahead and make sure any of the chassis screws always remain intact so that I don't lose them. Traveling with the gear all over the world, it does get bounced around and it actually takes some heavy abuse. So this allows me to keep all of the chassis screws in place. I do from time to time take all the tape off and tighten all the chassis screws to make sure that everything is secured. Both units feature a universal power supply so that way it'll work all over the world. Next to the IEC plug, I currently have a piece of tape, but we have an ethernet port that will connect inside to the Mac Mini. Next, we have two USB 3.0 ports. Next, we have our AES-50 ports 1 and ports 2. The MS-48 has two Lynx cards installed. And if you remember, each card does 24 channels of bi-directional audio, hence the name MS-48. Here, we have the Thunderbolt cable coming out from the Mac Mini on the inside that we installed earlier. On the second Thunderbolt port that we have here on the MS-48, that's connected down to the TB-72R, so that way these two units can talk to each other. Next, we have the DB25 connections that are associated with the Lynx cards. This is not something that we're going to be patching into, so that's why I went ahead and taped them up. Below the DB25 connections, we have an HDMI output as well as a Firewire 800 port. It's currently blocked by a Thunderbolt mini display port to VGA, DVI, and HDMI 
converter box. Because I'm using the KVM on the console to view and control the MS-48 with the mouse and keyboard, as well as the screen, I needed to get one of these. This is a Thunderbolt to mini display port that has a VGA as well as an HDMI and a DVI connection on the end. Without this, if you plug in an HDMI to a VGA directly into the back of the console and you engage the KVM switch, you're not going to have anything on the screen. Trust me, it didn't work. So RPM Dynamics let me know that this is something that I need. This is less than $10 and it's very, very easy to find. The Thunderbolt Mini DisplayPort to VGA adapter, I have that patched into the second Thunderbolt port on the back of the TB72R. We also have one other Thunderbolt port available. So if you have a Thunderbolt hard drive, we could use that for our multi-track recording storage. And finally, we have three more AES50 ports labeled port one, two, and three. This is where we're getting our additional 72 channels for multi-track recording. Once again, hence the name, TB72R because it's rack mountable. One really cool thing about the MS48 and the TB72R is that it ships out with thunder locks. The thunder locks secure our Thunderbolt cable connections. Since all of the connections on the back of the unit are with the Thunderbolt, the thunder lock allows us to have our connection securely fastened. Once we have the cable into the port, we can use the thread screw to secure and prevent any remo accidental removal of the cables. Now that that's done, I'm gonna go ahead and get it in the rack. I'll fire up the computer and then we'll get the cards configured as well as downloading and installing Tracks Live from Waves and then we'll be doing all the connections to get it integrated into the Midas Pro series consoles. One topic I wanna cover when you receive your RPM dynamic interfaces it does come with a USB drive that has all of the firmware updates for your Lynx cards. If in the event you don't have your USB drive with the firmware, or if a later version of the firmware has been released, follow these steps on how to download and install the firmware on all of your cards. To download the drivers for our Lynx AES-16 cards, we need to head to lynxstudio.com. Once there, we can click on the Products tab and scroll down the PCIe Express and then over to AES-16. Once inside the product overview, we can click here on the right where it says Driver Downloads. Once we're on the Downloads page, we can scroll through to find the latest version of the firmware as well as the platform of the computer that we're gonna be downloading it to. Since I'm on a Mac right now, I'm gonna go ahead and click on the Mac version of it. As you'll see, the download was almost instantaneous because this file is not very large. Another file we're going to need to download since we're here on the linkstudio.com website is the Lynx Mixer. Again, we're only doing this if we do not have our USB stick that was provided when we received our RPM Dynamics interfaces, or if the copy of the Lynx Mixer file we have is not the latest file, we can go ahead and download the newest version to have on our computer, or if we don't have a copy of the latest version of the Lynx Mixer. So to get the Lynx Mixer file, we can click on Products and scroll back down to PCIe Express Cards and we see that we have Lynx Mixer for AEX16 and Thunderbolt. Click on that. The next step is we're going to download the free version of Wave Tracks Live to use for our multi-track recording. So let's head over to the website and do that. From there, we click on Products and head to Live Sound Solutions. From there, we can click on Tracks Live. As we see, there is a purchase version of it, which gives you additional tech support and any updates and bug fixes. So we can head over to the free download tab. Here, we're presented with the options for downloading either for Mac or Windows. Since I'm gonna be running the Mac Mini in my server, let's go ahead and download the Mac version. From there, you'll have to log in or create an account if you're not already an existing Waves user. I am already a Waves user, so I can go ahead and put my login information in. Now that we've went ahead and logged in, let's click on the Mac download again. Now that the Tracks Live install is downloaded to our desktop, let's go ahead and do the installation process. Now that we have our Mac Mini installed into the MS-48 and I have it connected to the KVM on the console, we're going to need to go ahead and do a firmware update for all of the cards to make sure that the latest firmware is installed on all of the Lynx AES-16 cards. With the file that we downloaded and we have here on our Mac Mini, we're gonna go ahead and click on the firmware update icon that we find in the folder. I have it here on the desktop. Once we open up, we can see here the dropdown for all the cards that we have on our system. 
Don't worry if they're not in sequential order. We need to click on each of the cards that we have in our system to see our current firmware version as well as the new firmware version that we have. If they are different, then we need to update them. If they're exactly the same, then there's no need to update the firmware. As you see, all of our firmware is updated to the latest version, so we can go ahead and close out of this. If in your case you do need to do a firmware update, you can go ahead and click on update for each of the cards that you need to update the firmware. Just be aware that you will have to restart the computer in order for the update to take effect. So now we can go ahead and close out of this. Next, we need to go ahead and install the Lynx mixer on the computer. Here, inside the Lynx mix folder that we downloaded earlier, we find the install file. Let's go ahead and click on that. Now we can follow the on-screen instructions for installing the Lynx Core Audio driver. Now that the installation was successful, we can go ahead and click restart. With our computer restarted and our Lynx mixer is installed, we need to head into Audio MIDI setup to create an aggregate device for our RPM Dynamics interfaces. With Audio MIDI setup launched, on the left hand side, we see all of the connected devices to our computer. Of course, we have our built in output, and we see below that we have all of our AES 16 interfaces connected. We need to now click into each one and configure them appropriately. First, we make sure that we're going to set our clock source here to AES 50. That's because this is our system that we're operating on. You have the ability to go internal, external, header, LS stream, and all the digital ins. These are settings that we don't need to worry about, so we're just going to go ahead and be on AES 50. For input and output, it doesn't matter where we need to go ahead and select this, so let's just leave this on record one for now. As you click on each of the cards, you will notice that the numbers change. Again, this has no bearing on our setup. So let's go back to card one. Below that, this is where we have our clock source. For our setup, we're going to be recording at 96 kilohertz. Next, let's go through the rest of the cards and make sure our clock is set to AES 50 and our clock format is set to 96. Now that all the cards are configured, down here on the bottom left, we hit the plus sign and we select create aggregate device. If you double click on the aggregate device that you just created, it'll allow you to rename it. For now, I'm just going to name this RPM videos since I've already created and named an aggregate device for my Pro X recordings. On the right hand side, we see all of the options for the different devices that we can add to this aggregate device. Let's go ahead and click on all of our Lynx cards. Now we see that each of these are configured for its clock source to be on the AES 50 and that the sample rate is 96. Then here on the far right, we see that they're set up for 24 channels in and 24 channels out. The cards default to this. However, if on your system it's not set to 24 channels, we will head into the Lynx mixer to change that. We're going to be heading into the Lynx mixer in a moment, so I will show you once we get there how to change this and to confirm that it is set to 24 channels. And finally, we have the option to select our drift correction. It doesn't matter if we have this engaged or not. I personally like to leave it engaged. So now that we have our aggregate device named and created, we can close out of the AMS setup. Here inside the Lynx mixer, on the side, we have a tab for each of the cards. We can scroll through each of the cards to ensure that we are clocking on the AES 50 with a sample rate of 96 kilohertz. We've confirmed that all of the cards are receiving its clock on the AES 50 and that the sample rate is set to 96. Now let's click on settings, scroll over to advanced and click on adapter settings. Here is where we can see each of the cards are set to the 24 channel channel mode. So let's go through and make sure that they're all set to 24 channels. Great. One thing I want to point out now that we're in this window, once you reach the point where you're ready to patch audio into your multi-track recording software, if you find that the channel that you've selected is not showing up in the correct order, this is where you're going to need to go to reorder any of the cards. As you see, you have the ability to select the card and move it up or move it down into the appropriate location so that the audio lines up to your channel inputs. Keep in mind that once you do this, you're going to need to restart the computer for all of those changes to take effect. And as you notice, on the bottom, it tells you the same message. One thing I want to point out, if you're going to be using Tracks Live from Waves and you're in your multi-track recording mode, 
If you need to make any adjustments to the levels, you will notice that the software does not give you any faders to either increase or decrease any of the levels. If you need to make any changes, for example, if you recorded your gains either too hot or not hot enough, you can go in here and make those changes inside the mixing window. Here, if you notice on the screen, you see that I am padding down some of the channels. The reason for this, because the multi-track files that I'm using, I've changed my gain structure since I've recorded them. So now on my new show file, I have the audio coming back at the right levels. So now we can close out of the Lynx mixer and we're ready to install our Tracks Live software. Here we have the install file for our Tracks Live. Let's go ahead and initiate that. Now the installer window is open, we can drag the Tracks Live application into the Applications folder. We can go ahead and open up the Applications folder. Here we can scroll down to Tracks Live. I like to keep Tracks Live down here on my toolbar for easy access. So now we can click on Tracks Live to launch it.